is an 11 year US Army veteran. He's also a serial entrepreneur and I'm gonna have him tell you a lot more because he's really an incredible human being. Welcome to the show, William Yetsky. It's good to be here, thanks for having me. Yeah, we were talking a little bit before uh, we started and before we even get into this, I'm gonna have you uh, reiterate exactly what you just said about the cover of your book because I wanna to touch on that first. Okay, so the the cover of the book is a real picture that was snapped um, after an incident that had happened to where uh, the Taliban drove a vehicle IED up basically to the front gate of the compound that the guys from 2nd Platoon were staying in, a Bravo company, 2508, and they detonated it, like, over a 1,000 pounds of explosives and uh, pretty much flattened the compound. I mean, guys were buried alive. Um, there's actually a story in there from one of the guys that was former first platoon. Um, and he had been at ground zero on nine 11. He was a uh, part of the New Jersey firefighters that were responding to nine 11 as they were coming across the uh, bridge um, in a bus that was commandeered by NYPD and New Jersey. Uh, just, I, and I had never known that. So like hearing this from him, I was like, Oh my God, like this your viewpoint, I think, because you were former first platoon needs to be in there. But there's so many stories in here that are just woven throughout. But the cover picture uh, was snapped by, um, there was a group of three of them that were going through the recovery. And uh, Brian Erickson, I believe, is the one on the on the right in the, in the picture. And Eli Rivera is the one on the left. And uh, Sar Sergeant uh, Rodney Garcia had pulled the camera out of Erickson's um, hip pocket and snapped this as they were recovering the flag and pulling it out uh, of the rubble. And it just kind of exemplified the feeling behind, you know, you can knock us down, but we're just going to keep getting back up. You're not going to move us. And as soon as I, I had a feeling years ago, but I didn't get it. I didn't understand until this whole thing came to be. And, um, and then I just knew I had to have it, you know, and once I tracked it down and everything, it was kind of the publisher at the very beginning was like, well, we're not sure about the title, you know, there's a swear in it. And we're not sure about, you know, your concept behind the picture. We just don't see it. So I was like, I'll have something into you by tomorrow morning. And I sent in like a rough picture and the title and stuff on there. And, a, and then a story behind what had happened. And I literally got a call from England the next morning and they were like, I get it now. So you have the cover, you have the title, you know, what else can I do for you? So I just asked for the moon <laughs> <laughs> and they, and they gave it to me. And here we are like a year later with, um, with the book. So, oh, oh that's cool. And you said it's going to be presented, um, coming up on a very special day. So the, yeah. So the flag from the cover there is. Uh, it was recovered um, as we were leaving, I guess, uh, you know, specialist Erickson had replaced out the flag and ta had taken that one that was featured in the cover had taken it with us because it kind of meant something to him. I mean, it literally, it must have taken a lot to hand that off. Um, but uh, the flag is being dedicated down at the Airborne and Special Operations Museum in Fayetteville, North Carolina on Veterans Day and is going to be part of the, you know, the permanent DOD historical catalog. So that stuff's been put in there to be preserved for perpetuity, along with, uh, believe it or not, along with a bunch of other artifacts that the guys have um, dug up and found and donated to the museum that are featured within stories like in here, like there's an assault pack that has um holes in it from ball bearings that had gone through from a suicide bomber and he had been standing there just seconds prior um and he had put this bag down and was responding to the incident and then was running towards it and was blown backwards and during the explosion like he realized afterwards after they're uh recovering from it and he goes to take a drink of water about 10 minutes after and he's like, why are there empty water bottles in here? I have filled up. We had just gotten here. And he realized it was full of holes. And it had been right where he was standing, um, but seconds prior. So just the, I guess, just the historical aspect behind it 
Um, there's another guy too. I mean, just an incredible uh, story to where by rights, he should have had his arm blown off um, during this particular incident. And strangely, enough, I, I'm not a big religious believer, but I do believe in the spiritual end of things and like, you know, the energy around us and there's definitely everything is frequency. And, but there's something to be said when this kid had a pocket new Testament in this shoulder pocket and the ID explosion, he had his arm out at the time he was helping this guy along this wall, blew the sleeve off of his uniform and it stopped right where that new testament was the weirdest unexplainable and this is like just give me so many incidents i know right <laughs> like it's it's wild just some of the some of the incidences and some of the just high energy um incredible stories that that happen here you know to where you have these extreme highs and these extreme lows and it's all in there i mean it's there's some rough stuff. Like I know one of the guys got back to me. He's like, man, he's like, some of that was really hard to read. And yeah. um, where, you know, your show deals with these uh, surviving, these traumatic incidents and, and stuff. Um, I was a little concerned at one point because guys are like, I am experiencing, you know, olfactory nerves. I'm smelling things from the battlefield. I'm having cravings of um, alcohol or, to smoke something when they haven't in a long time. And it just goes to show just how deep rooted some of these traumas were. And it was um, with some of the guys, they had to really face some stuff when they opened up and we talked, but I think the best part about writing this and myself included, I mean, I've definitely been affected um, in it and realized a few things about my own perception of what happened as well as, um, the way that it affected me. I know it was, it's different. It's been different. Um, but in talking with psychologists and stuff along the way, kind of seeing how prefrontal cortex and stuff is developed at certain points. And I was a little older during this particular deployment. I was 28. So experiencing this stayed with me a little differently than some of these other guys who are 19, 20. Right. And this was the deployment where it had a 52% casualty, right? Right. Yes. So I, it's hard to wrap your brain around being 28 years old and realizing that it's a flip of a coin, whether you live or not. At one point, it definitely, it started to, and I think a lot of the guys that were there faced this, but at one point I was leaving, I was leaving the gate to go on another patrol. And I was on a lot of these cause I was the, uh, I was the guy who carried the radio. And we were in an area to where you had to have the RTO with one of these particular radios on every time you went out, because that was the only way you were going to keep in contact. Like it was, um, there was a high iron level in the soil content along with some other stuff that who knows what we were exposed to, um, but it impeded our radio frequencies. So you could really only reach like maybe a click out. Um, I had to have the antenna up. It was, it was just so strange to be on this modern battlefield, but experiencing communication issues to where, you know, this is mil military spec equipment, you know, sending cryptology over digital channels and, and they can't even reach more than, you know, a thousand meters out in some instances. Wow. So dealing with all of this and having to go through this and going through it with all of your buddies, you know, and I know you guys get tight out there. You guys are going through all of this crap together. Yes. You're still in touch with a lot of those guys now, right? Yeah, that um, even more so now with the book and stuff, but that really came full circle in 2018. Uh, there was a, um, a nonprofit by the name of the Independence Fund that they were running something called Operation Resiliency, which this was our company ended up being the pilot program for it, but it was taking these um hard hit units and stuff that were kind of flagged by the va uh saying hey this is a high risk unit for suicide it had happened we've had quite a few i think the battalion at this point is up to 30 um plus suicides and it's you know yeah it's 
it's humbling and it's crazy to see that. And it's just, it, it's sad to see that, that we're not taking care of our guys, you know, in that way, but they were doing a peer to peer type support, but with VA uh, psychologists and stuff like clinicians and everything available that were there. And they sort of used it like a unit reunion, like get these guys together. Um, and they flew us all down to Charlotte, North Carolina. And they did a, um, an event like combined within the city and they did some stuff with uh, team building events like the, I think they did the river rapids and um, we did some ax throwing and everything. And it, I mean, it was just, a, it was a good time and it was great. It, it was to see these guys again. It was like uh, somebody that you've ever experienced this type of thing and been pushed together like this, seeing them, it's like, you never left, you know, you just pick right back up where you left off. And um, it was really good. It opened up a lot of guys and, I mean, one of them even confided at one point that he had been contemplating suicide. And when he got the call, um, that this reunion thing was happening and he just decided like, well, it'd be one, it'd be one last great thing to, to see the guys again before I go. And it changed everything, you know, and now he's somebody that works within the system, trying to help out guys in that situation. So it's been really, it's been neat to see where people have landed and how things like this have uh, positively affected, you know, Absolutely. people that maybe otherwise wouldn't be here. And it's amazing what can happen just by being in somebody's life too. I mean, what a great example of that. This guy's life has changed forever now because you guys were there. Yeah. Yeah. So what helped you to be able to heal from all of the trauma that you had been through and experienced? I mean, I, so I, you really have to go to where it affected me differently in the first place. I mean, I was definitely still affected and uh, writing this and stuff has had a lot of it to where it slowed me down enough to start realizing, okay, there's certain things you do that aren't normal, <laughs> you know, checking the locks at night, but like being obsessive about it, um, you know, or certain things with my kids and like, it's like, Hey man, they're they're kids. They don't have to be ready to, um, you know, there, there's certain things that are healthy, like, Hey, be aware, be mindful of the situations around you. And if you see something or feel something that doesn't feel right, like let your parents know, like there was actually somebody in the mall recently was looking at my kids real weird. My daughter pointed it out and it gave me the creeps and I kind of have that radar. And I was like, Whoa. And I went to go up to the guy and he took off. And it was almost like an affirmation, like something was wrong there. And my daughter had pointed it out and it was like making her aware of that type of thing, which is great. But in some instances going a little too far to where it's like, Hey, they're, they're still kids, man. Like they, they don't, you don't have to raise this kid to be a little, <laughs> I think the uh, TV show is, yeah, I know like, exactly. Like a little <laughs> Hannah, <you know? laughs> the CIA, CIA can't hold her in uh in, in the brig. <laughs> But, you know, as crazy as it is, the world is becoming more and more like that, where if we don't teach the kids to be aware at young ages, they're going to be set up to be in these dangerous places and positions. And there's definitely a fine line there. And there is. And it's I know that that's one of the things that I push out there that a lot of um, the guys that might be searching for purpose and stuff, because, I mean, really, that's what brings a lot of us into the military is is that sense of purpose, doing something that's greater than ourselves and and being an asset, you know, to the people around you and to society um, is that they have that radar and they have that instinct built in where they can flip that switch to where they are that person who's, you know, not hyper vigilant, but like vigilant to like what my and mindful what's happening around them. And they can be that either leader if necessary in the community to kind of, Hey, like let's hold some classes or something, or let's like talk about this. Um, with people, what would you do in this instance? Because some people just don't know. And we sort of live in a society to where that sort of um, that leader in the community is much harder to find these days. Yeah, absolutely. That's crazy. I'm so glad you're doing this for your kids. How old are your kids now? So I have a little four. At, well, he just turned five and seven year old. But uh, you would never know. They 
both seem three years older because their mom is also six foot. We're both six foot tall. <laughs> so my daughter's already like four, seven, four, eight. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's nuts. <laughs> I'm expecting her to shoot up past you guys at this point. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. But man, we're in trouble. She's uh she's got my kind of spitfire attitude and um, you know, she's she's a knockout like mom. So oh. <laughs> I got my hands uh my hands full for sure. <laughs> so where are you originally from? Do you still have a relationship with your own family? I do. Um, it's just a little different. I mean, they're at a distance, but uh, they're up in Connecticut. So I grew up in a small little New England town, 8,000 people, Thomaston, Connecticut. Um, and just this little uh, New England manufacturing town. And the backstory to the town's kind of neat too. It's um, clock manufacturing, uh, Seth Thomas clocks. So he was sort of like the Henry Ford of clocks where they were really expensive. He just was like, hey, I think everybody should have one and created a manufacturing process that made it simple. And they sold cheap clocks uh, and tons of them. So in the entire town, it was uh, renamed after his honor. And, you know, this the main factory building is in the middle of the town. And uh, my dad actually had a springs and stamping factory that he went in on with three three partners. And that's what I grew up in is my dad was at the shop and Mom was trucking us around to uh, the different school or church events. That's pretty cool. It must have been a little bit of a culture shock to join the military and suddenly have the whole world in front of you. Not completely. I uh, I was a little bit of the black sheep, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I liked you. Know, you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Got that Yeah, that little fire in me there. Um Basic, my nickname was Wild Bill, and it kind of stuck in some of the military stuff. Uh, if you look up on Goodreads, some of the guys that have gotten pre copies to to review and, and know the stories and stuff wrote up on there, you know, hey, Wild Bill. I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> I'm gonna catch it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I I joined up at 26, so I had already I did three years of college towards a bachelor's um prior and dropped out kind of due to the parents like hey you're we're not supporting this this partying anymore so i went on to do motorsports and racing cars and uh doing stuff with the pit crew and then eventually driving my own vehicle and pgt uh rally and rally america and then the college sweetheart kind of um she went a different way you know and i was heartbroken and i started spiraling and uh i kind of realized like hey man you you're wild you know people like you you got a vision you can do stuff you have it together on that end but you need some discipline you know and what life brought me to where i was and honestly um i really think that i like during that time in the argonob and everything with some self-reflection and stuff i was exactly where i needed to be that was amazing I'm glad you got out of there. I'm glad you survived. And I'm so happy that you're doing all of this to be able to help so many others now. I mean, you're a hero still. And even oh, though man. you're never going to accept that phrase, you're not going to say that you're a hero. The you're rest of us can right. say it for you. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I still, I mean, yeah. I think the guys that the book is, you know, there's a dedication on the inside there. And those are the heroes to me. Yeah, I love that. I have so much respect for you. It's super cool. So your book is available through your website, which is damnthevalleybook.com, where people can go and find the signed copies. It's also available on uh, Amazon, and it's it's kind of all over the place. Y'all can go and find it and pick it up. But I am going to make sure that I have links to all of your stuff, including your Facebook, your Instagram, your YouTube, and your TikTok. I'm going to be stalking you on those things, of course. Um, <laughs> just because I love what you're doing. I want to keep up. I mean, thank but you. Of course, of course. It's time for my most favorite question of the episode, always. And it's a hard one, so it's okay if you need to take a pause. Oh, man. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take it. <laughs> what is one thing that you truly love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? Ooh. Oh, man. Definitely. 
it's both a blessing and a curse. Your mind is just amazing. You know, the ability behind it and everything. And I've really, um, turned my focus on that end of things, you know, to where you kind of, at some point in your life, like after the military and everything, um, I wasn't, I got into a bad place physically. Um, I was 270 pounds, um, and things were working so like cognitively much slower uh had much more depression you know didn't really deal with certain situations all that great felt like i was in a funk but getting that physical end um and it was actually another veteran a gym up this way that it was a crossfit gym that um one of the owners was a navy vet you know we talked and i kind of had a little bit of that rapport and so i was like okay i'll come back and really doing the workouts there and stuff felt a lot like military. And there was a lot of military and first responders there. And within a year's time, I mean, lost 70 pounds and feeling better about myself, thinking much better about everything, like putting those habits in line. But it was the that physical end of it was like the start, the baseline and the foundation of everything that once you get that into place, things start adding up differently and working differently. And really that's where I think I'm at is that mental aspect and focusing on that end and really realizing the potential behind what we all have within us. SBC Ross, I hadn't even wanted to be on this patrol with the frequency of everything that was going on at COP where there was no time to get anything done, much less sleep. He was always exhausted because if there was any detail to be done, he would be the one that always seemed to be snatching it up. Having been there longer than the rest of the lower enlisted in first platoon, it seemed to be a curse because there were some NCOs that would depend on him if they needed anything done. They knew he would get it done and it would be done right. As they approached the compound, he felt a chill like those that you get when you enter a haunted house and the temperature drops 10 degrees unexpectedly in the matter of an instant. Ross shrugged the feeling off and followed in everyone's footsteps as the area we were coming in had been cleared already. Lieutenant Demarest called to the team on the roof of the building because he was worried about spotters calling out our position to the insurgents in the area. Ross had been boarded on this day and Johnston was already headed up to the wall to get eyes on the surrounding area. I'll go, he exclaimed, as he could use that moment of solace to just get away from the bullshit going on within the compound. A breath of fresh air would be nice, and Johnston was just the guy that would understand. They could enjoy the silence and the scenery together on the rooftop as they shared a smoke. It had been a rough week, and with his fellow weapons team members on leave, Ross would, have, would fill the gaps in patrol needs as well. It was utterly draining. <clears throat> Thomas was pissed as he had been headed to the wall when Ross had just jumped out there and started immediately scaling the wall. He edged up only a few feet behind Johnston. It was a weird wall that had some breaks in it in the structure and sloped up a bit to the roof of the building that was within the inner areas of the walls. It wasn't unlike a lot of other tricky mud-built architects you would find everywhere in the valley. Towery was Towery had a walking stick or something and held it up for Ross to steady himself as he made his way up. Just helping a guy out as we all had to do while crossing some of the terrain and man-made features that peppered the landscape and made going about anywhere of distance miserable. All of a sudden he felt something he had all of a sudden he felt like someone had cracked him in the back of the head with a bat or something. What the hell? It was right underneath where the protection of the helmet ended, and one of the vital areas in the neck hurt like a son of a gun if you were hit there in any capacity. I've seen guys go down from a proper cut cuff to the back of the neck in that spot before. Black. What the hell just happened? His brain was catching up. Where in the... What the... Everything was tilted and his neck hurt something fierce. It took a moment to realize, but he figured out that he was outside of the wall and on top of his head. There was dust everywhere, and in his mouth it tasted terrible. With a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach, Ross figured out that they had hit an IED. There was grunting coming from the orchard in front of the men. The orchard. 
He was the only one outside of the wall. His brain started to panic because he knew that the enemy would probably be coming soon. He was outside of any sort of security perimeter and completely alone. He started to come out of the fog and quickly scan the area for his rifle and his assault bag. He had everything he needed right there. Let the bastards come. Could there be any better way to go for an infantryman? His family had history in the Vietnam War with an uncle who was killed in combat after having been up and down the conflict areas and even into areas of Cambodia. Let them talk of how Ross took his chances on a last ditch effort to take as many down as he could before he, they cut him down. There was no other option for someone like Ross. This was it. There was that grunting noise again. What the hell happened? Was someone hit out there? As he finally got his rifle in his hand and was able to make the sense of the entire scene, he turned his attention to the pile of material that was making noises. As his eyes came to focus and his brain started registering what he was seeing, his curiosity turned into horror as he realized that the shape had a uniform pattern to it. It was Johnston. It was as if Satan had come to the Agridab to play a, play a sick and twisted marionette puppet show with a patrol squad of soldiers. As the puppet master, he had tossed the figure as Johnston into the air and had just dropped the figure onto the stage in a discarded pile. Johnston was folded over and in half with his face in the dirt and was trembling as his body was starting to move and go into shock. The noises were changing now and getting louder. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Ross could hear Thomas screaming in the compound at the realization of what had just happened was washing over him. Ross needed to get to Johnston, but there could be mines everywhere out there. He was flying blind here. Ross decided to crawl as low as he could to the ground and do a series of checks for IEDs as he made his way to see what he could do. He couldn't believe there was any way that Johnston was still alive. It looked like every bone in his body had been broken. Ross got to him and got what was left of Johnston back onto his back in the, in the field. Dude, it hurts me, he told Ross. Ross couldn't believe Johnston was alive at all and actually talking to him. There was no way this going, guy was going to live through this, but he had to try. Ross pulled his own tourniquet out of the medical pouch on his rig and got it around what was left of Johnston's leg. It was pulverized, but his right leg was already gone. There was his femur sticking out of his left and what appeared to be enough structure to press down on and seal off the bleeding from any arterial wound. Although who knew how that would even work as it looked like Johnson's entire pelvis had been smashed. Ross could literally see into this guy's organ cavity. Ross started to crank the tourniquet down to hopefully stop some of the blood loss. That's when Johnston started screaming. I need someone out here, Ross screamed for help. But this wasn't something he could handle alone. He needed the doc out there, and he needed him right now. Doc Ponce finally made it over to the scene, and Ross could see that he had gotten screwed up from the explosion as well. Doc was half blind, but operating at a level of focus that can only be explained as a properly trained combat medic doing his job. Ponce ripped his medical bag open and threw Ross a package as he started ripping into another packing, Johnston's ripping into another and packing Johnston's wounds with Curlex to stop the bleeding. There was so much going on with both of them working at a breakneck speed to save him. The pair synced in a pattern of efficiency that allowed them the feeling that they could, there, there could be a chance. Johnston was still talking to them and asking if he was going to die and how bad the damage really was. Ross didn't even know how bad it was. He just told them that he was going to be all right and to stay with him. Just keep talking to him. Johnston started to say that he was having trouble breathing along with everything else that he was talking about. Bobby Musil and the rest of the QFR were the most welcome sight Ross had ever seen when Bobby crested that wall. The pararescue helicopter had gotten there just when Johnston's eyes went cloudy. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. 
And remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself. 